Well, good evening, friends. It is a joy and a delight to welcome you as we continue the 182nd Convention of the Diocese of Missouri. Welcome to tonight's festivities as we welcome the Bishop of Atlanta as our featured guest. Uh, for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, um, a few housekeeping um, opportunities. To ask a question at any point, feel, feel free to use the ask question feature or put questions in the chat that will be answered um, by our, or that will be put to Bishop Wright or anybody else on the panelists um, from the chat. Um, so please feel free to use that. Um, it is my pleasure and my joy to welcome the Right Reverend Robert Christopher Wright. Um, Bishop Wright was elected on June 2nd, 2012 um, by the Diocese of Atlanta to become the 10th Bishop. Um, he's only the 10th Bishop in the 105 year history, so they're a little bit younger than we are. Um, and he began to serve as Bishop on October 13th of that year. He was consecrated in a special worship service at Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel on the campus of Morehouse College, and he is the first African American to become Episcopal Bishop in Georgia. He has served congregations all the way from New York and most recently in the Diocese of Atlanta, where he has been, where he now serves as Bishop. Um, on a personal note, he has served as both a friend and a mentor of mine. Um, since we both hung out in Atlanta many, many moons ago. Um, and he has also been my bishop coach when I was elected to help me in the transition from parish ministry into becoming the bishop. So it is my joy, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, the Right Reverend Robert Wright. Good evening. Good evening to all of you. Um, greetings to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, and greetings also from your brothers and sisters in the Diocese of Atlanta. Uh, we are here, 117 worshiping communities, 56,000 men, women, children, teenagers, and feisty seniors. Uh, it's a great delight for me to be with you uh, here on the occasion of your diocesan convention. I know intimately how important these gatherings are for relationship and understanding and discipleship. Uh, let me also say that it's wonderful to be here with your bishop, Bishop Dion. Uh, as he has said already, I've known him for many years and he didn't need much coaching at all. Uh, he's quite a smart fella. Uh, and I know him to be a man of God, a family man, and someone who brings good cheer and godly imagination uh, to his work. So uh, for those of you who may be wondering, uh, you got a good one. I can tell you that for sure. You, you've got a good one. Uh, the text for my presentation this evening comes from the book of Esther. I hope that's a book that's familiar to you. It's the fourth chapter beginning at the 12th verse. And there we read, Mordecai sent word to Esther. And it said, don't think that just because you live in the palace that you will escape the plight of your people. For if you keep silent at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for your, pe from, for your people from another quarter. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows, Mordecai says, Perhaps you have come to this royal dignity for such a time as this. So then two times Mordecai repeats the phrase for such a time as this. So let's take a hint and use that repetition to give our sermon a title. How about this for a title? The time is now. The time is now. The book of Esther is not only a young woman's coming of age story, it's also her coming of agency story. It's a profound example of what partnership with God can look like for the benefit of the human family. Still, the story is as old as the Bible and as current as today's headlines. In Esther's world, injustice is ubiquitous, 
indifference is flourishing and vigilantism is being named as a virtue. Simultaneously, people of good faith and good cheer are being seduced into non-action by what appear to be overwhelming odds. In other words, bad seems so far ahead in the game that good entertains the idea of giving up. Here's Esther. Can you understand her? She's made it, been upgraded, started off life as an orphan and now she's the queen of all she surveys. Now because of grit and grace, she doesn't have to worry about affording doctors or medicine. She's not worried about eviction or poor education or lack of opportunity for her children. But if I use my sanctified imagination, as Dr. King called it, I can see her looking past all of her blessings and out the window in her palace at the plight of her people, of God's people, her human family. I can just imagine that under her fine garments, in the pit of her stomach, she had no peace, no real peace. Maybe there were two questions playing on her internal loop. Question number one, what does it mean to live a godly life? And question number two, am I doing enough with what God has given me? These weren't cliche middle-class guilt pangs she was feeling. This was the love of God and of neighbor swirling inside her looking for a new outlet. Mordecai had raised her to always think of God and of neighbor. But where does one even begin to make a difference in this world? And what about the cost of doing good? Is now the time for all of this? After all, she could lose her wealth, her reputation, maybe even her life. And I got to tell you, this is better than Netflix and Hulu, y'all. It really is. Into this conundrum steps wise old Mordecai. He sends words to her by a messenger of love and of life and of faith. What he is doing is using his age, wisdom, and knowledge of God's ways to invite Esther more deeply into the faith that she already possesses. What I'm saying here is that faith is the transfer of energy riding on a word that can reimagine everything. Maybe when Esther looks in the mirror, she sees a damsel debutante looking back at her. But when Mordecai looks at her, he sees a deliverer. Faith is the transfer of energy riding on a word that reimagines. Now is the time for words of faith coming from lives of faith to imagine new possibilities. We worry and we should about our aging denomination. The average age of the average Episcopalian in the average congregation in America is 66 years old. And while there is a certain downside to that, there is an opportunity present also. What if like Mordecai, those of us in our golden years, those of us who are long in the tooth, those of us who wear the gray crown, started to transfer faith energy to one another, particularly those younger than ourselves. We learn in leadership studies that the status quo will elegantly defend itself when it's challenged. And if that is so, then what would happen if you and I took the status quo by the scruff of the neck in our parishes and our dioceses and made risk-taking faith the new norm, I've learned in my 10 years as a bishop that when the elders in a congregation decide to be bold in faith, things change. When that group prioritizes fidelity over tradition, Things change. The time is now. 
As God told the prophet Joel, I will pour out my spirit and your young people, and they will see visions. And I will pour out my spirit on your elders, and they will dream dreams. Mordecai's dream became Esther's vision. We have a choice to make. Will you be an usher for the new order or an undertaker for the old? Who is better equipped? Here's my question to you. Who is better equipped to leave the renaissance that the people than the people who have known God the longest and lived by faith the longest? But not only that, Mordecai doesn't only charge Esther to bring new boldness to her faith. He speaks to her of God. He says, in effect, that where, whether you get involved or not, our God is alive and our God is active. Professor Walter Brueggemann reminds us that God is not limited by the reluctance of God's potential partners. God's purposes will not be thwarted. And thank God for that. And that love is actively rebelling and overthrowing everything that is not love, even as we speak. Everything that is not love is cracking and crumbling, just like an old bridge, even now. We know God does not need us, but thank God, God wants us. God delights when we participate in God's purposes. And there is not a true abundant life without an active partnership with God. I hope it's okay to talk about God here. I say that because one of the best places to hide from God is in the church. We get so busy with the when and the how much of things that we forget the why of it all. It reminds me of that old story, the Lord Bishops of England were uh, convening. They were meeting to deliberate the most important issues of the day. But one bold woman slipped a note to someone that was read from the microphone at the very beginning of the meeting. And this is what the note said, my dear Lord Bishops, Please do remember as you gather that God is the most interesting thing about the church. God is the most interesting thing about the church. God did not cause COVID, but God can use COVID and God is using COVID. This is what I've been saying to my diocese for 18 months. And how I see God using COVID is that people are getting back to why, getting back to God getting back to purpose. The purpose of the church is to worship God in spirit and in deed, to partner with God in an ever enlarging friend-making campaign. The purpose of the church is to increase the celebrity of Jesus Christ. That is our why. That is the gift Mordecai gives to Esther when he calls her out of the cul-de-sacs of where and what and how much and delivers her to her why. It just may be, he says, that the reason for your title, your elevation, your access is to join God right now in turning garbage into gold. The time is now. Why does the Diocese of Missouri even exist? Why does the Diocese of Atlanta, for that matter, exist? There's no shame here, no guilt, no obligation, no arm twisting, not even in Mordecai's words to his beloved daughter. Only an invitation, an invitation always to go deeper, to close the gap between the words we say on Sunday and how we live on Monday. I like to say Mordecai was probably an Episcopalian, so he knew that Obligation connects to one part of the brain, but invitation and wonder connects to another part of the brain altogether. And so I wonder what God has been inviting you to do 
recently. I wonder how you are changing the world for Christ's sake. The final movement in the text has to do with what it means to be a sibling to all of humanity. Mordecai told Esther that to choose silence and indifference rather than to act on behalf of siblings in peril is to refuse partnership with God and to frustrate grace. For if you choose silence, he says, God will still act, but you won't have the joy of what it means to be a Good Friday partner while you're heading to an imminent Easter Sunday. We know what the baptismal covenant says, that we will persevere in the face of evil, that when we fall, we will repent and return to the Lord, that we will proclaim the good news of God in Christ. We know that. You know that. But we also say that we will strive for justice and respect the dignity of every human being. There are some who recite the baptismal covenant and think that they are making a personal declaration of commitment to the church. I understand that thinking. But a better understanding of that covenant is that we are accepting a personal invitation to public greatness. Not celebrity, not self-aggrandizement, but an invitation to greatness as God defines greatness. Jesus helps us understand here on his mountaintop high and lifted up moment, with his garments turning the color of brand new snow, Jesus had an experience with God. And his friends, so caught up in that moment, wanted to build three tiny houses on that mountaintop. But Jesus understood that mountaintop experiences of God are simply rocket fuel for valley low interventions on behalf of God. Those experiences bless us because they give us cosmic assurance for horizontal endurance. The best indicator of vertical exposure to God is horizontal devotion to neighbor. Didn't Dorothy Day say it just right? Dorothy Day said, we only love God as much as the persons we love the least. The time is now. The time is now to deepen our devotion and broaden our hearts. We follow a Savior who was high and lifted up by the very fact of being God, but chose to pour it all out to show the love of God. And it is our high privilege to be associated with him and his work, to put ourselves in the fingernail dirty places of the world, of Missouri, for Christ's sake. I would imagine that as Esther started to live the word, she prayed more meticulously. She caught people by surprise. I mean, she took the majesty of being queen to places and conversations previously thought to be beneath the dignity of a queen. And that is the thing, friends, about God. Once you realize who God is and who you are in God, the whole world becomes full of siblings. Esther had to act. She had to say yes. And that's what you and I are invited to do today. No matter how far we've fallen, no matter how deaf we've been to God's invitations previously, no matter how weary, weary we are, in this COVID malaise and hangover, we are always invited to begin again with God, to say yes again to God. The time is now. It's time for your mind and your behind to get in line. That's true peace. Peace is not the absence of turmoil. Peace is to will one thing in the turmoil. I can just see Mordecai swell up with pride, the pride of a parent, when he sees Esther become who God called her to be. And I can just see God swelling up with pride when God looks at us, individuals and congregations and dioceses, living into who God is calling us to be and what God is calling us to do 
in this new season of ministry. All of this, this entire story and this entire season, for me at least, brings the words of Maya Angelou to mind. And she said this, the sun has come and the mist is gone. We see at a distance our long way home. I was always yours to have, you were always mine. We have loved each other in and out of time. Before the first stone looked up at the blazing sun, or the first tree struggled up from the forest floor, I had always loved you more. You saw me lost, hurt, injured by chance, bludgeoned by circumstance. I screamed at the heavens, loudly screamed, trying to change nightmares into dreams. But the sun has come and the mist is gone and we see at a distance our long way home. I was always yours to have, you were always mine. We have loved each other in and out, in and out, in and out of time. The time is now, beloved. God bless you. I think we went to church this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Bishop Rob. Um, just a quick reminder to those who are joining us on the webinar or on Facebook, um, if there are questions, you can use the Q&A or on Facebook. If you'd like to offer some comments, we can, we can try to answer your questions. Um, and Canon Whitney and Canon Doris will be joining us on the panel to um, further um, round out our gathering and to pull some questions in from and in their context. So Canon Whitney and Canon Doris, you can feel free to jump on screen. So I can say to you, Bishop Rob, that I have been fervently taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so one of the things that you said um, is what you talked about a risk taking faith. Yeah. Um, and could you say a little bit more about how, how, how does one live into that risk-taking faith? I mean, yeah. I, and I'll give a little bit of context because you and I both know that we live in a time and a church that is um, peopled with fear. Yes. And we, we are afraid of so many things. Yes. Um, and risk-taking tends not to be something that fearful folks do. Yes. So in a time like this, with all the division and pandemic and everything else that we're face, facing, yes. What, yes. what does that risk-taking faith look like? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Bishop Ian. I, I, I think, um, well, first I want people to know when I say that I'm, I'm not, I'm a guy with a mortgage and five kids and three of them in college, you know, so I'm not, I'm not talking about stupidity here. Uh, what, I, what I'm talking about is closing the gap between the words we say on Sunday and how we live on Monday. I think that's the first thing I want to say. I think the next thing I want to say is, is, you know, what I love about the Psalms, the Psalms are emotionally honest. It's an emotionally honest place to talk to God. Uh, these psalmists, they say the things that we really feel ourselves. You know, they speak of vengeance sometimes and they speak of fear and they speak, they wonder where is God and why is God. So I, I think one of the things we've got to do on the way to risk-taking faith is to be really honest with God about what we fear, right? Um, but, I, but I think when we talk about risk-taking faith, what we're really talking about is uh, can we get into the truth of things? And so one of the great first steps that Jesus seemed to always take and, and leadership teaches us is that you've got to try to get the truth in the room, right? And, and there, sometimes that, that, that's the hardest part about risk-taking faith. And so this is why we look at our calendars and our checkbooks and say, does my calendar and my checkbook actually line up to the words I pray on Sunday? I mean, that's the, that's the first part. And then the second part is, is that does my life actually look like the baptismal covenant? You know, I, I highlighted in the sermon that one part of the baptismal covenant says, will you strive for justice? We could start right there. And, and, and we can ask ourselves without condemnation, without judgment or shame. That's not what this is about. It, it's about alignment, right? I mean, the baptismal covenant is a gift. And it's coordinates. These are road markers for us. 
And even when we fall, even the baptismal covenant says that we are to uh, repent and return to the Lord. So it's not about being uh, getting trapped in some call to sack of shame, but it's actually saying, how have I striven today for justice in the world? You know, how have I respected the dignity of every human being? How have I enlarged that? Uh, sometimes uh, taking the risk is, is us being at a vestry table uh, and acknowledging the fact that we're, we're really afraid to spend our dollars in ways that are really faithful. You know, um, I don't want to get anybody in any trouble, but I remember I was a rector a long time ago. And uh, one of the great intersections we got to as a, as a vestry was we decided that we were going to do our, in our Diocese of Atlanta, our fair share is 10%, right? So that was a step up. We got to 10%. We said, we're going to be full team players. We're going to share the responsibility for leadership in the diocese. That was one piece. And then the next piece was, we we're going to give away 10%, right? We were making a big push, inviting people to tithe. And so we were saying that we're going to tithe as a congregation. And it took us a while to get there, but we got there. And we found that we had plenty, always had plenty. So sometimes that risk is in really small and practical ways. And then I think it expands out from there. Thank you. <laughs> Bishop, could you talk with us a little bit about the reality that we're carrying strands of grief yeah. along with that call to innovation and risk? And I think yeah. a lot of us are having trouble carrying both of those at the same time. Could you talk oh, with yeah. us about that? Thank you. Oh, what, a, what an amazing, what an amazing question. I mean, um, what we're talking about, what we're talking about is, is that um, whenever we're talking about change and adaptation, et cetera, we're also talking about loss. And what I have learned, uh, and look at all my gray hair, what I have learned over the years is, is that, is, is that we, we really sabotage real success in innovation if we don't pay attention to the loss. And so this is, there's a reason why St. Paul named as a spiritual competency to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice, right? So, so what I have learned is, is that um, if people can, if you happen to be a part of the group is wanting to initiate change or thinking about change, and you, you give people a sense that you actually appreciate the loss involved in the perspective change, you, you, you honor them. You honor them. Sometimes we can get so fixated on the shiny thing on the horizon that we jump a step, we skip a step, and we don't even acknowledge what it took to get to where we are that now we want to change. And so I, I would say that that was the, the biggest piece. And that happens in congregations, and it happens in dioceses, and it happens in lots of different places. But I have found that you can really share, uh, people will join you. Uh, you know, uh, these things are hard, but people will join you if they have a sense that you really appreciate how hard this is going to be. And let me also say that the rocket fuel for that has got to be a visceral purpose. That's why I talk about why a lot. So, so a lot of people are right to say, change, why would I want to change, right? And, and one of the reasons they're saying that is because we haven't given them a visceral why, right? And if we don't do that, if we don't give them a missional why, right, that we have some sense that, is, that we, are, we have landed on because of discernment in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit, then we're just competing opinions and that you just can't sustain that. And so people have got to have an abiding sense that we're on our way somewhere meaningful and that my loss is worth it if it contributes to something redeeming. And so uh, what I have learned is, is that uh, we've got to slow down a bit and be more thorough uh, as we investigate what the loss is in the group. We've got to also make sure that we're talking to people who we vehemently disagree with. One of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten in this was from a very seasoned priest who said to me, Rob, remember, you've got to do two things at the same time. You've got to move with those who want to move and you've got to pastor the rest. Yeah, not everybody embraces change at the same time. And so, so, so what we learn is the competency we learn from people who want to exercise leadership is, is that um, slow down, be thorough, right? Have your purpose clear and then make your move. Uh, thank you. And the, there are a couple of questions that we have from both Facebook and in the chat. Um, there's one on Facebook that asked Bishop Wright, you talked about letting the truth in the room. 
Yeah. Can you talk about what that looks like and maybe some practical ways we can expand experiences and voices at the table? Yeah, I appreciate that. Priya Parker has a, a wonderful book. It, it talks about how we gather. I, gather. I would commend that as a resource. Um, a, a lot of times, well, here's the best example I can give you, Bishop Dion. In the Episcopal Church, we are legendary for having a meeting and then having a meeting after the meeting in the parking lot, right? And in the parking lot, what we find out, y'all are all laughing, so you must know what I'm talking about. So, I have no clue what you're talking no about. Clue. I know, of course you don't. So, <laughs> so but, but what, what, from a systemic standpoint, that's fascinating, and I'll tell you what that means. It means that, that we have somehow got the message in our system that the truth is inappropriate for the actual meeting, right? And that's why people take the truth into the parking lot. So one of the things we've got to learn is, is how to run better meetings, right? And what we've got to learn is we've got to develop a competency in those of us who convene meetings to allow people to disagree. And we've got to develop a culture that allows us to disagree without being disagreeable. This is a culture shift for many of us because what we think following Jesus means is to be nice. That's what we think it is. By the way, friends, nice is not in the Bible. To tell the truth in love is in the Bible. To be kind is in the Bible, right? I, I don't trust nice. In the South, I'm in the South, y'all. In the South, nice is a four-syllable word. Nice, right? In the South, we say, bless your heart, right? We call that polite hostility. But, but actually what it's doing is, is that it's giving the, the, the blessing of Christian fellowship short shrift. See, what Christian fellowship means is that Bishop Dean can call me and say, Rob, you know, I know you meant well, but this was, it, this was very uh, offensive to me. And we can talk about that. He can get that truth in the room, right? That, that strengthens our, our fellowship. That strengthens our brother, brotherhood, right? And so we've got, to, we've got to decide as a culture, as clergy, as lay leaders, that we actually want a congregation, a diocese, where no side meetings are necessary because we have found a way to get it said in the room. Now, it is true that the, one of the words that one of the phrases that we've used in the Diocese of Atlanta, I commend to you, because so, so what's the bar then to get it in the room? Because some people just want to throw bombs in the room, right? So we've talked about kind candor, kind candor. So if it can be candid and it can be kind, then it passes muster to get in the room. But it's a cultural shift to be sure. But it, let me just say one tack, one last thing onto this. The reason why that is so critical is not only one, it helps us to have genuine Christian fellowship, but two, it keeps the creative tension in the room so that we can come up with innovative solutions in the room. It keeps the disagreement in the room so that we can figure out good solutions instead of taking that stuff to email and to text messages and parking lots. Bishop Wright, um, the last two years have been very, very exhausting for clergy. Um, and we are um, tasked with holding out um, hope to congregations um, and, and our flocks where everyone is just so tired. Um, I, I appreciate the slowdown I, and how alien that is um, in our culture. Um, Hope is so important. It, it, Bishop Dean and I talk about this all the time. That that hope is a <laughs> is a Christian virtue. Yeah. Um, how can we, as clergy, ministering to our flocks, and everyone is exhausted, um, hold out that hope when some of us might be holding on by a thread? Yeah, a lot of us are holding on by threads, laying, laying ordained alike. Uh, we are holding on. And I, I, since you asked a question about clergy, I'll, I'll stay there. And I know personally what it's like uh, to be at a challenging inter intersection in my own life while ministering to people who are in challenging intersections in their life, right? I, I understand um, what that kind of depletion feels like, right? And so uh, I think what we've got to do is we've got to get back to basics here. Um, we've got to get back to basics and be innovative at the same time. Let me tell you what I mean. Um, you know, it is, a, it is a sign and mark of Christian maturity that you and I know how to balance action and reflection. So I'll, I'll just say that, right? Because I, I really do believe that. I really do believe that you and I 
uh, in this business that we, we find ourselves in this location, we've got to have some savvy with the tools of action and reflection. And we've got to realize that none of us is irreplaceable, right? And so sometimes we behave that way. And what we're really doing unintentionally is infantilizing people. So we don't want to do that. Jesus always went on his prayer retreats. Jesus always went, went on his long morning walks and all those kinds of places he was away from the, and, and it built a competency in the, in, the, uh, in the disciples. And so I would say to my brother and sister clergy, take your sabbaticals, take your day offs, take your vacation. Come on, too much is at stake. Your health is at stake, right? The Christian maturity of your group is at stake. I understand the good intentions. I swear to God, I do. I really, really do. But it, it, you, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to model for the folks, right? We can't preach heaven while we look like hell. We just can't do that, right? And then the second thing I would say, because I have been a rector in a congregation with no assistant, I have been that person, right? And, and so I think now uh, one of the great benefits of COVID is, is that it has accelerated innovation. And so our congregations can do morning prayer without us, right? We can develop lay leadership. We can develop late preaching. I mean, I don't know what Bishop Dion has in mind, but one of the things that we're doing in Atlanta is we're lengthening the menu, right? And so we are going to license uh, people that we have, we decide are qualified to be lay preachers, right? So we're going to give the clergy some, uh, some support in that regard, some resources in that regard. And there are congregations in our midst who have an abundance of clergy. And we think it's charitable and Christian to share out of an abundance. And so, so, you know, just as, uh, you know, out of a, you know, off, off the, from the hip, I would say, these are a few things that come to mind, but it really starts with agency. Yeah, you know, you and I have got to say, you know, there's too much at stake here and that we've got to be good stewards of, you know, our mortality and our health. We, we really, really do. And, uh, you know, I've got 117 congregations. Yep. And I, I feel like it's part of my leadership modeling to my group to be unavailable on Friday, except in absolute catastrophe. That's just that I have to do that because the clergy are looking to me in the way that laity are looking to so many of us to, to see a, a balanced life model. Re remember our ordination vows. Will you be a wholesome example, it says. And so, again, let us close the gap between our ordination vows and uh, and the way we and the way we're actually modeling it. And I think COVID has given us a great opportunity to get back to these basics and reset. But the weariness is real and it's legitimate. And you know it. I, I know it very well here. And please, by the way, let me allow me to say this, uh, Ken and Doris. Friends, please talk to somebody. Please get please get into therapy. Please call your bishop. Please, whatever, please get in spiritual direction. We have a platinum insurance uh, um, policies uh, with regard to mental health in the Episcopal Church. We, do, we really, really, really do. And let's not wait till it's too late. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Does it sound like I have some experience with this? <laughs> Indeed. So, um, so Bishop, just to change gears a little bit, we have a yeah. question in the chat, a question yeah. from the chat that says, today, when the justice system exonerated a white supremacist, and we know that a black person would have been convicted, how do we share our truths when we won't accept our truths? Yeah, well, that's always been the work, hasn't it? I mean, that, that is always the work. I mean, uh, I, I must say I was disappointed today. Um, I was disappointed that uh, Mr. Rittenhouse uh, is going to walk away scot-free. Uh, I think there, there is some concern by some of us about um, prosecutorial overreach in terms of first degree uh, murder. Uh, but I also think um, being the father of three black sons, I'm not sure that my sons would have uh, come home uh, after the trial in the way that Mr. Rittenhouse is coming after the is coming home. So, and, and, I'm, and I'm so sorry for the parents who had to sit there and have their grief magnified uh, and, uh, and multiplied uh, today. But what I would say is, is that, you know, this thing about God's justice in the world is a long haul. 
and we are going to lose yeah. many, many battles, right? The good news is, is that everything that is not love is going to crack and crumble and ultimately love will win and it will be peerless, right? We know that and that's what gives us hope. That's the only thing we have as far as hope is concerned. Today, as far as I'm concerned, and I know there are opinions that, are, uh, that run contrary, today is a, sit back, a setback that today emboldened vigilantes in America. That's what it did. White, black, whatever, whatever color, today emboldened vigil, vigilantism uh, and today emboldened lawlessness. Uh, and, and it makes me sad. And as I was telling Bishop Dion and, and the Cannon staff here in Georgia, we're, we're waiting on pins and needles for the Ahmed Aubrey uh, yeah. verdict. And uh, so we <laughs> solicit your prayers. But I, I guess what I would say to you is, is there's nothing new about sin there's nothing new about oppression and injustice, right? The fact of the matter is, is that what we've got to do is not despair. What we've got to do is step by step, uh, continue to fight the fight for justice and equity for everybody, for everybody. I, I can't help but, but look at this screen and see an example of what I'm saying. It would have been in the year of my birth, which is 1964, in the year of my birth, my ministry, Canon Dion, Bishop Dion's ministry, Canon Whitney or Canon Doris's ministry was not possible. But because of the faith and the hard work of men and of women of many colors and of many orientations and from all walks of life, here we sit as siblings, right? Exerting authority in a church that was not in a hurry right, to uh, exemplify the very best of civil rights. So I would say to you, chin up, right? We're gonna take a lot of hard punches, a lot of hard punches. We are going to take a lot of hard punches. People are afraid and that's what's driving vigilantism. They're fear. Yeah. This country is shifting to competing groups of minorities, right? We, we see the browning of it, uh, of this country all over. And it is causing some brothers and sisters to be terribly afraid. And fear leads to hatred and violence and retribution and vengeance. And this is what we're seeing. And I think this is the season that we're going to be in. And so I, I would say to us, this is an opportunity. We have, this is in some ways, sadly, this is the perfect environment for us to witness to Jesus Christ. And to say to people, we understand fear, fear is legitimate. There are other ways to process it than taking up a war grade weapon and putting yourself, you know, as a murderer to people. So uh, that, that's, that's what I would say. I would say we have an opportunity. And remember, we read a book called Holy Women and Holy Men. And, and these people had difference making, risk taking faith when the odds seem stack against them. And, and here we are, their inheritors. There's a, a, a combo question. Yeah. Um, one came in through the Q&A. What does a risk-taking church look like? Yeah. Um, and a follow-up kind of, um, do you have any suggestions on how to help our parishes? This is coming from a clergy person. <laughs> deal with the grief and trauma people have endured over these tw last 20 months. Yeah. Yeah, a risk-taking uh, church. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm 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 hesitant because you know context is everything. Mm -hmm. Context is everything. Ministry context is everything. So I I don't have any cookie cutter uh, answer, and I don't I don't want to sound like a some kind of smart aleck or know it all. I don't know. I, I do know that what we've got to we've got to ask ourselves as we're making decisions at the vestry table. Uh, is, is that we've got to look at our budget and ask our budget, how is our budget demonstrating risk-taking faith, right? I, I think that um, sometimes we can be, we can do what we've always done. And so one of the ways to get to risk-taking faith is to begin to ask ourselves, who is our neighbor one, three, and five miles from the church and ask them, do they know us? Do we know them? Uh, you know, that, that can lead us down that road. Desmond Tutu used to say that the poor who live in pro close proximity to the church 
uh, are the people who should be able to give a reference for the church. And so that's, that's, that's a way to begin to say, who are we? And if our church disappeared tomorrow, would anybody care? Right? Um, I, I think that in, in particular counties, um, you have particular issues. I think a risk-taking faith might look like to go and to pray with and support law enforcement, while at the same time to go and to love and to pray and support the people who are oftentimes on the wrong end of law enforcement. I think this is one of the great things about being a Christian and watching Jesus walk through Galilee is Jesus is with the lepers and the Pharisees. He's with the leaders of the Pharisees, the tax collectors, and those with checkered past. And so there is this, uh, we, we get an example of risk taking faith that allows us to be in relationship with all kinds of folks. So if we are for the Second Amendment, uh, are we, and we're sort of NRA, NRA folks, are we in actual generative conversation with people who see the world different, right? Um, if we happen to be clergy who are sort of forthright against this and against that, when's the last time we did a ride along with police officers? You know, I think that brings a freshness to our faith and allows us to come to the pulpit and allows us to come to the vestry table with nuanced understanding. I think that Jesus was really a marvel that he brought all these relationships and conversations to his story making for us, right? So he's knowing these people. He's, no, he's watching the old people. He's watching the young people, the sick people, the least and the left behind. He knows them. It's not just a Facebook post he read about them, right? He knows these people. So risk-taking faith, I think Brian Stevenson is right. It, it is somehow connected to proximity. And the truth of the matter is, is that I'm an upper middle class guy and, uh, and so are my wife and so are my kids. And if I don't take intention and put myself in certain places, then it would be very easy to not talk to anybody who's very different from me. And so I think that that's one of the things the gospel is inviting us to do. In COVID, I challenged my folks to, uh, to say no to lots of things and commit to one thing for three years. One thing to, to three years um, that it takes you to a constituency that you know nothing of. So for some people, we've gotten word that some people have gone and spent time with, we have a big Hispanic population here and a lot of chatter about immigrants, but mostly from people who have never talked to an immigrant, right? Uh, legal or, or elsewise. And so we've invited people to do that. I think Jesus uh, invites us to do that. I think there's some risk there for us because what we risk is we may learn that we've been wrong or we've been callous and then we have to change and see the world in a bigger way. That was the first part. What was the second part, Bishop Dion? Uh, the second was um, any suggestions for how to help our parishes deal with the grief and trauma people have endured the last 20 months. Yeah, I, I thank you. I, I'll make this a shorter answer. I think one of the things we've done with the clergy group is you've got to develop circles. Maybe you already have circles and you've got to let people talk about it. So one of the things that we did, we convened conversations and said, what have, what have you lost? What have you lost? And we've lost love, livelihoods. We've lost loved ones. We've lost lots of things. We've lost familiarity. We were disoriented, all those. Sort of, so I think you got to help people process these things and let them cough that mucus up, if you will, right? Uh, Brueggemann in a, in a book called Reality, Grief and Hope says that we never really get to authentic hope until we get down to the bottom of the barrel of authentic grief. And I think he's right, right? So I think, you know, we can mouth the words, hallelujah, Christ is risen. But the truth of the matter is you got to have some visceral sense of Good Friday to really get to Easter Sunday in integrity, right? So I think you got to let people have a space. Uh, to do that. And I'm a kind of a person that I'm not a long griever. We grieve at different ways and different speeds. So what I had to do as a pastor was to slow up and try to get in the center of my group, try to make sure that I'm listening and creating space so that I hear from the center of my group that we are processing these things. Because I think some of us really want to stiff upper lip the thing and race off. And I think that there are, there are liabilities if we do that. So Bishop, we've been talking in our diocese about uh, the, the Bible as post-traumatic literature, people <laughs> telling stories of how they found God coming through collective pain. So I'm wondering, what are you seeing in your context, maybe post-traumatic growth outside the church that we could be learning from? 
Say, say a little bit more about post-traumatic growth, Winnie. Well, you know, to me, that is the whole story of the Bible. That's the triumph of God, that, yeah. you know, the, the people found a way to connect their story of pain, even a large oh. collective story of pain, into God's story. Yeah. And that's what gave them the strength to take it with them into resurrection. So. Yes, okay, I think I got it. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things we've been trying to talk about is, is that, um, you know, God didn't cause COVID, God, God didn't cause COVID, but God can use COVID. And, and that little uh, cute saying taps into this resurrection theme all through scripture, where God makes a way out of no way, where, you know, where there's water and food in the desert and all, you know, all those wonderful stories where the bones begin to rattle and dance and become flesh and bone. So, so there is this thing about God that God makes a way when it seems like there's no way. I like to say God can turn gold into garbage. And so I think part of that is being able to, to pay attention for that, number one, right? So I think that what a lot of people want to do in congregations uh, is, uh, is to hurry up and return to post-COVID norms and numbers, right? And what we're talking about in the Dallas of Atlanta is not simply being resuscitated, but being resurrected, Right. And the, and the difference being that we are looking for more than post uh, pre-COVID numbers and pre-COVID norms. We're looking for more than that, right? We're looking for a deeper sense of faith from people. So we're raising up that expectation. So I think, number one, we've got to tell people that that is the character of God, right? This is who God is. If you, if you want to spend some time with God, this is who God is. Number two, we as lay and clergy have got to raise that expectation, Right, that we're not just trying to turn return uh, to uh, to cruising altitude, but we want to use this. I mean, what is Good Friday? But the very example of this, right? Jesus doesn't just show up resuscitated, right? He shows up resurrected, which is he's more than the former Jesus. The wounds are still present, but he's more than the wounds. So, what I would want for individuals and congregations is to somehow springboard off of COVID, right? One of this is. Can we get back to a clear reason why we exist? I think this is the biggest thing I would say to you is to have congregations and vestries tend to the question and diocese for that matter, why do you exist? I know how long you exist. I know what your budget is. I know what your endowment is. I know how many congregations there are, clergy there are. That's all fine. Praise God for all of it. But why do you exist? Why do you exist? And I think when you get to why you exist, then you have some fuel to do the springboard. I think a lot of congregations don't know why they exist, right? I mean, I think if you asked 100 people in a, any given congregation, you get 117 answers, right? So I think that so, so, so energy around why do we exist? And I think that's when people begin to imagine. Even brain science tells us that. Simon Sinek's work tells us that. If you can get people down into why, then we become more generative. And so I think that's what we're really talking about. How can we generate out of this? And as far as congregations are concerned, you know, I, I'll tell you a story that I heard some years ago, which blew my mind about what can be possible if we're willing to think big. Uh, there was a little congregation in Baltimore that uh, had only a few people and a huge building. And they finally got to that one sad meeting where they realized we can no longer drag this building around. Sound familiar? And so they sold it. And you know what they did with the money? They bought two apartments in the housing project where this, close to where the church is. And they ran an after school program in a drug infested neighborhood for kids who needed a safe place to work on the three R's after school. That's church. And they taught those kids to pray and they taught them something about Jesus. They had no overhead. They bought those, they bought those apartments. So I think we're only limited by our imagination. And so I think that's what we've got to do is say, you know, to have conversations, meetings where we're not just clicking off an agenda, but we're just, what we do is get on the balcony and wonder together, what does fidelity, write this down. This is the best gift I'll give you all tonight. What does fidelity require right now? That's the answer. Because if you go there, then lots of things can percolate. What does fidelity require right now? And I think it requires something uh, highly nuanced from the way we were sort of holding things pre-COVID. Let me remind you, friends, that the Episcopal Church had declined by 25% over the last 10 years. And that data was released just before COVID. We forgot that. 
We've got nothing to lose for swinging for the fences right now. We got nothing to lose. We got nothing to lose by trying something big for God. Nothing. We got nothing to lose. It's never been a better time. That's why the title of the sermon was The Time Is Now. We've never had a better time to run experiments. Anglicanism teaches us, just so people don't think I'm a, a crackpot, I've actually read our literature. The best expression of Anglicanism is to hold tradition in one hand and the exigencies of time in the other hand and to live in the tension. So we're not running after anybody else's, how they're doing things. Neither are we just sort of uh, holding on to tradition until our knuckles turn white. But Anglicanism, the best expression, lives in the tension of tradition and revelation. That's on page nine in the Book of Common Prayer. And so this is actually who we are. I think uh, Bishop Dion is going to take me to task later on. Oh, oh definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you. I am I, loving it. At least I gave you the page number. I gave you the page number. You're, you're, you're echoing a lot of what I've, what I've been saying. So, okay. no, right. thank you. All right. Well, you, you, you mentioned um, a very, pro a, for me, a very pro pro provocative line that the purpose of the church is to increase the celebrity of Christ. So, could, yeah. you, could you expand on that one a little bit more? Yeah, I, well, thank you for, for saying that. I mean, you know, the catechism tells us to reconcile reconcile people to God and God to people and, and, and to reconcile, be reconciled one to the other. Of course it is. But, but when you think on it, when you really think on it, what does the church have that, that nobody else has, right? So there, uh, there's a lot of organizations that do a better job of feeding and clothing and all those wonderful things that we do, and we should continue to do those things. Don't, don't hear me wrong. But what we've got, what we, what we are stewards of, is what life with Christ is like. That's what, that's what, that's, that's the headline, folks. That's the headline. And so if we're the stewards of that and, and we're having our own personal experience of the goodness, the benefits of that, then why wouldn't you tell somebody, right? Why wouldn't you tell somebody? When I became the bishop, people told me about uh, the realtor I needed, the doctor I needed, the jeweler I needed, the place I needed to buy my bed. I mean, I had these amazing recommendations. Evangelism is just recommending Jesus. I mean, so Episcopalians are really good at recommending stuff. We are fantastic at recommending stuff. We ought to recommend Jesus, right? I mean, if, if, if you think Jesus is worth recommending. I personally think that... Um, more people love Jesus than love the church. I think especially young people, young people still think Jesus is way cool. They're a little curious about his friends, but they think Jesus is way cool. And so that's, that's our brand. That's what we have. It's this wandering, woolly-haired son of a day laborer who was lynched outside the city walls in front of his mother and came back to love and reconcile. That's who we have. And that still preaches. It still preaches. And so when I talk about increasing the celebrity of that, I'm talking about not only with words, but how we live that way. Jesus was a lot more fun than we make him out to be. He was a lot more. You don't just start. You don't accumulate a crowd like that if you're just boring. Right. You've got to be kind of a you got to kind of be a guy who delights in people. You know, quick with the smile. Uh, you know, 70% of communication is nonverbal. What did Jesus, what did people see in Jesus before he even opened up his mouth that attracted them? It, 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 it boggles the mind. And so when I'm talking about increasing the celebrity of Jesus, I'm talking about keeping the main thing, the main thing. And I, I think we have been entrusted with something phenomenal. And the truth of the matter is, boys and girls, is, is that we don't know what's going to happen to all the buildings, but we know that the story of Jesus is going to live on. We know that people are still going to meet God in Jesus Christ. We know that. I know I'm as clear about that as anything I know, that this story, this reality, this truth is going to live on. Why, thank you. 
So are, are there other any other questions for in the chat? I, I suspect I could come up with about a million more, but <laughs> <laughs> are there well, any questions from the folks who are? Well, you had also mentioned, you know, and, and, and I love the image that um, God does not need us, but God wants us. Yeah. And how do we as a church live more into that? Because, and here's why I asked the question, because if you turn on the TV, if you go on social media, everything is designed to either sell you something. And then the way they sell it to you is by telling you that you're not enough, you know, the, the shampoo you're using isn't good enough because, <laughs> you know, the, to the, the toothpaste is somehow going to transport you to the beach and, you know, people are going to be singing and all this stuff. Um, so, so we live in a culture that, that says to us, you know, what you have and who you are isn't enough. Yeah. And so when, when you say that God doesn't need us, but that God wants us, can you yeah. talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, I mean, just again, just as, so people know I'm not completely crazy, you know, these, these comments come uh, grounded in Scripture. You know, scripture tells us that, that God said uh, in the Psalms, if, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, right? So, so, so God is not sitting somewhere and needing to be satiated by us. And the truth of the matter is, is that though we, though we feel warm and fuzzy when we sing songs like God has no hands but ours and no feet but ours, the truth of the matter is if God is only limited to my hands and feet, then God ain't really God. So does God want us? Yes, which is more important to me than that God needs us because the way that God wants us is the way that God chooses to be God, right? So God chooses to be God in a particular way. And that way is always inviting us to join God in God's purpose so that we can be partners with God, right? And so that we can understand life abundant and understand what relationship with God is like intimacy, have real intimacy with God. I used to be in the Navy a thousand years ago and I used to jump out of helicopters. That's what's wrong with me in case you're wondering. And, 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 and I can tell you for all the conversations I've had in the church about fellowship and mission, they all pale in comparison to spending 12 hours a day in the Indian Ocean in helicopters with guys on a mission. When you're close up to people on a mission with one another, you get to know each other in a great and wonderful way. I'm still friends with some of those guys 30 years later. And so God doesn't want us, but God, God doesn't need us, but God wants us. God wants us to join God so that we can know God. And also in that work, that's the anvil on which God makes souls so that you and I are be we become enriched as human beings. I was just with, I, I have a podcast and y'all should find me there. It's called um, Four People with Bishop Rob Wright. It's on, uh, here's a shameless plug. It's on uh, Spotify and iTunes. Come, come see me there. But I was just with Sister Helen Prejean. Uh, whose, whose life they made a movie out. Sean Penn made a movie out, Dead Man Walking. I'm telling you that that woman is salt and light. I'm telling you, this woman walks close to God. She knows God. She knows God doesn't need her, but she knows God wants her. And she has met God in cells with, uh, with terrible murderers uh, advocating for their life as well as other people's lives. And so uh, I, I guess what I want to say about that is, is that uh, there's a security, there's a security, uh, uh, Bishop Dion, there, I think that the world can't give. When you know you are loved and wanted by God, and you start to believe the way God feels about you more than what Cosmo or Vogue or Esquire or, you know, when you start to believe that more, you begin to have life. I tell you, uh, I've got to know, I got to know uh, Ambassador Andrew Young, who was here, who was Martin Luther King's lieutenant, C.T. Vivian, who's now dead, John Lewis. I'm telling you, when you meet these co-laborers with God who have been dif difference making in the world, it, it is extraordinary. To you can smell freedom on them. You see why they weren't afraid to die, because they knew beyond the shadow of a doubt they were just going home to God. I mean, they love, they have loved ones and all that sort of stuff. And so I guess what I'm saying is, is that that is available to us. That is available to us that you and I can walk closer to God. And then some people might be listening and say, Jesus, is this guy talking about being some kind of religious freak? I'm not. I'm not. Sly and the Family Stone, a 70s rock band. 
right? They had this wonderful, wonderful song called Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself. And this is what I'm talking about. You have never been yourself as much as you can be yourself with God. There's a freedom there. There's a freedom there. You don't need any pretense, no false charms, no nothing. It's not about your vitae. When you start to understand that you are accepted by God for all that you are, the blessings and the blemishes, that's a freedom. That's something that the world can never give. You know, a perfect haircut, a, a wonderful waistline, the perfect number when you get on the scale in the morning, none, all of those are good things, but they will never replace me knowing that I belong to God and that I belong to you and you belong to me. There's no replacement for that. And we still have that. And the world doesn't have that. We have that. Oh, I think I heard a second sermon. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, no. Keep, preach on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just cherish these opportunities to really encourage people. Uh, I think that's the other thing I found in COVID. I found, honest to God, I found that, that I didn't have faith. I found that faith had me. I find that I was really ministering out of somebody else's grace, right? And uh, and and I, I knew that, but in COVID, I, I I landed on that again, right? That we are, you and I are just conduit. We're just, we're just conduit, and and uh, and so we've got to encourage each other because this is a, this has been a tough time. Yeah, we've got to encourage each other. Well, as we look to wrap up, there's a, a final question in the chat, um, and it comes from Michael Shipley. I understand the need to think big, but is it possible that we are thinking too much and not listening to God? So many, inspira uh, so many inspirations come if we ask and then listen. A teacher of mine once said, if I, if I don't know the answer, I know someone who does. Yeah. So I suspect, is, what does holy listening look like in this? Well, I mean, it's critical. I mean, I'm, I'm the guy who took a class at the MIT Sloan School about uh, uh, leadership as inquiry. Uh, because here's what I know. I know that if you ask, if you don't have real facility in asking questions, what you usually get is the same stale answers. And so one of the competencies I would name is uh, you and I becoming better question askers, right? And so I think if you come to the Diocese of Atlanta, you will hear people talk about me not being quick to give answers. So I trust exactly what you're saying. You've got to create that space and you've got to use these tables, these meeting tables that we're in uh, to begin to develop cultures where people can say anything so that we can get it stirred up. This is what I'm talking about a little earlier. So yeah, listening has a lot to do with it. Here's what I wish uh, congregations did more of. I wish congregations landed on one prayer for a season and said, we're just going to pray, pray this prayer for a season together and we just put that in part of the liturgy i would also say to you that uh our uh, uh if you go to the back of our book of common prayer we have seven genres of prayer seven genres of prayer and the two genres that we usually don't three genres that we do, usually don't use in any of our liturgies are adoration praise and oblation so what would it be like what would it be like to say for a whole season a whole liturgical season that we're only going to pray adoration prayers, right? Because most of our prayers look like, you know, CNN spiritualized, right? You know, this, 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 that, you know, and you, 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 sometimes you can barely get a word of thanks in sideways, right? But what if we normalize using all the seven genres so as to get to Mike, your point is creating a space to get all the, all the way down deep in it and see what the spirit will do. And I'll tell you one genre that we really don't do, which has everything to do with what we've been talking about tonight and that's oblation. We do not formalize oblation as a prayer genre in the Episcopal Church. Now, I've, been in, I've been doing this a little while now. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe y'all do that in Missouri every day. But I've, been, I've done 45, 47 dioceses uh, in one configuration or another in the teaching ministry. And I can tell you, I've, I've not seen it yet. But I would invite you to do that. What would it mean to say, here we are, God, we're all yours. We don't want anything from you today. How can we serve you today? What would it be like to pray that for four weeks or six weeks as a group and then wait to see what bubbled up? You, you, you're attempting a liturgist. 
So, I know. Okay. <laughs> I know exactly that. But but it but it's true. Beware. What would it, what would it be like to use? I think we do penitence pretty well. Obviously, that's mm -hmm. imposed on us at length. I think the average one of us is pretty good at Thanksgiving. I think we're really good as a church at intercession. But those other genres, I'm not so sure. Yeah. There was a quick question about what is oblation. So in about 30 seconds, how can how would you define oblation? Oblation. It's just it's just a fancy word for I pour myself out. I pour myself out in response to the goodness of God. That's all it is. I want nothing from you, God. Nothing at all. I just want to offer you me. Hmm. That'll pray. That will pray. And let me tell you, I double dog dare you to pray that. Here I am, God, use me. Don't, don't, do not tempt me, Bishop Rob. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you, you want to change your life? You want to embark on something risk-taking? Do that and be serious about it and see what God will do. Well, thank you so very much. It was a joy to be with you this evening. Uh, you have a standing um, invitation to come to the Diocese of Missouri by Zoom or in person or by any means that you can get here. Um, this has been wonderful. So thank, thank you. you once again. On the behalf of the folks of the Diocese of Missouri, we are so grateful for you and for your ministry, and we look forward to having you back again in the not-too-distant future. Thank you. Thank you. Delight to be with you. Um, for